Good morning and welcome to Flat Out the Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry, where was it you say you went last night, Ronnie? A beautiful little kebab shop. Well, it was a restaurant. So, yeah, a kebab was... shop restaurant? Yeah. And waiters were bringing you Don and Meat and Chips? Yeah. What sounds good? No, With a bit wait- of salad? The waiters brought me Don and Meat. I upgraded to a chilli and garlic naan, because you get a normal naan. But is it the Don and Meat like, that's like donkey meat? And it's got... Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's literally like on a like stand that swirls but around. That thing that, that we have meat? traditionally of, oh, it's one o'clock in the morning, I'm off my face, I need a kebab. Donkey meat. And then you see the remains of it in the morning and think, oh, my God. Yeah. Now, this sounds like how kebabs are meant to be done. Like proper on a skewer. No, it was like... looks like donkey you've been meat. sliced off one of those machines. Oh. You couldn't see the machine, but it was beautiful. It was so nice. But it wasn't grey. It was like a, a, no, a donkey. It was, it was a nag, a, a naga kebabish. Mm. It was beautiful. It's just very hot though. Because I'm looking after my waistline. I've mm. been really trying. By going out to restaurants. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And all that business. So and I'm, eating late at night. I've realised I, <laughs> yeah, I can live off shakes, like you, and protein shakes, and maybe a bowl of cereals. And but that's not healthy. Pardon? It's not healthy. Why is that? Because it's got no fruit and vegetables in it, and no nutrients, no fiber. There's fruits. It's just protein. No, but in my smoothie, I have. And cereal's um, full of sugar. Sugar free. <laughs> sugar free cereal. I also have <laughs> fruit in my smoothie. I also have spinach, sprouts, and broccoli in okay. my first smoothie. Okay. That's nice. Chai seeds and all the rest of it, almond grated, whatever. Oh, so you add to it? Yeah, I add to it, and then. I have a bowl of cereal if I get peckish mid-afternoon. Kebab and chips on the evening. And then, <laughs> and then wreck it all by going to a kebab restaurant. Late at night. Fibers in, fibers in the chips. Huel drink. There's fiber in there. That's everything. You need all your nutrients. Does it keep you regular? This morning, I nearly did not come to <laughs> podcast. I got up, felt rough, and I thought, okay, this will pass. So I'm sitting on it's my sofa. donkey meat. What is it with donkeys? What's could, wrong with donkeys? The that. poor donkeys are out to sit there. Going, <laughs> hang on we get the wrong idea about kebabs in this country because they're associated with being shit faced and going into this slightly seedy, tiny little takeaway with a counter and just this great big metal stick with this skewer of grey matter on it that may or may not be meat, which we then cover in chilli sauce and the salad goes all over the floor, and come the morning, it actually looks radioactive. Yeah. Whereas kebabs are not that at all. No. If you go and have them in the place of origin, they're yeah. actually a delicacy. Yeah. They're really, really nice, and this place was nice. Yeah, but my son was made to have it this morning. Does that explain the picture you chose to post on the WhatsApp group? <laughs> I don't know what was more worrying, the fact that... I sent it to my friend. That it was someone's bollocks, or that uh-huh. the, the person had gone to so much trouble to arrange themselves <laughs> to make their testicles look like a love heart. And that's what actually. Is made... this what people do to that's make me? Me. I know what I'll do. I'll cross my legs slightly and I'll make my testicles look like a love heart. That'll make a Valentine's Day. Well, this is like. Oh, yeah, happy Valentine's, people. Yeah, happy Valentine's. Um, <laughs> And all the rest of it. Yes, it is Valentine's, although this will go out two weeks later. It's a typical man's thing, isn't it? You know, mm. he wants to get his hand away, and then he's like, oh, I know, I'll show a picture of my balls in the shape of a heart. <laughs> and he thinks that's going to win. That's, just, that's as far as they get. It's something. just a very strange version of romantic, isn't it? <laughs> it's a man's version of romantic. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's a man's version of romantic. <laughs> this is what you want, isn't it? Want that's to... love right there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, what else have we had this week, apart from you going to a kebab shop? Is it from all the way on me today? Well, that's going to be on you first, Ronnie, first. if you want. Oh, I don't know what's been going on. I really don't. I say this every week, and I don't know what the hell goes on. I know I do meetings, and I know I do all the stuff I need to do. Isn't that enough? That's more than because enough. I'm doing more than enough at the minute. You say, Ronnie, I've got nothing to say, but you always have something. Of doing You've always more. got something to say. I've always got something to say. And you look really well. Do I? Yeah. I haven't even shaved this you morning. You look well. I just drag look healthy. myself out of the bed. That's because of all my healthy eating <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and water. I'm drinking plenty of water. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to go through a week and say, 
oh well I do this and I do that but I'm not really quite sure what I've done because it means you're basically doing the groundwork do you know and not noticing it it's a, I always blame a lot of stuff on OCD but everything's done like a machine you switch a machine on it just runs and I feel like a machine it just happens I don't yeah. even need to be concentrating it just happens <laughs> Do you know like what I mean? the routine structure. It is the routine thing, isn't it? And it's the fact that it's ingrained in you now after a period of time that this is what I do anyway. And special things like the excursion to the kebab restaurant are on top of that. What was my invite, by the way? Do you know what? Oh, just a malarkey. Because rude, I wasn't rude. even. The donkey told him not to invite me. <laughs> Do you know where I've got that from? My dad's at a hotel in Blackpool when I was a kid grew up there and my friend from over the road from another hotel used to tell me that that restaurant over there got done for donkey meat in the kebab so I just would never eat it again I was just like no I can't not eat it and it's, it's stuck in my head so I was going to one day you're going to be walking home in the dark <laughs> and you're going to look down an alley there's going to be three sets of eyes and there's going to be three donkeys <laughs> they're going to be and they're going to keep the life out of you. I love donkeys. Saying, what is wrong with us? You can eat me. I guess there's no difference to eating a donkey, to eating a horse, to eating a pig, to eating a sheep, to eating a cow. It's the same. It's all animals. It's just a different breed. It's like China, they eat dogs and everybody has an issue with it. But it's the same as eating a pig, the same as eating a cow. Of course it is. It's just what we've it's decided. It's just what we've humans decided of what's to good judge. and what's not good. And yeah. What we deem as culturally acceptable. Yeah. And there's also a good bit of old-fashioned English snobbery there as yeah. well we'll eat this but not that that's what the underlings eat yeah. that's what the poor colonials eat we eat this because we've got the best stuff and, if, and we have this determinism and then you've got certain religious beliefs that mean you don't eat this or don't eat that you've got people who are genuinely vegetarian people who are fake vegetarian people who are vegan people who are fruitarians there's all sorts of variations around it aren't there I'm more concerned about the revenge of the donkeys. Yeah. <laughs> if they know that for years, for years, for decades, they're kind of been hunted down, stripped to the carcass, and then stuck on a big metal stick in a kebab shop somewhere in, I don't know, Runcorn or Bolton or wherever, and that this has proliferated all over the country, one of these days, the donkeys, are, they're going to get together and they will Even revolt, they will come at us. In Mexico, they hit them with a bat to get all the sweets out of them. Sweets. Poor donkeys, piñatas. You hit yeah. the pin the tail on the donkey, that's a game. What would, poor donkey? Would you really want to be kicked by four donkeys at once? No, have you seen one of those things? From all sides. Let me know how that goes. And, and I don't mean the you. cute little donkeys on the beach that they won't let you ride if you're over four foot nine. These vengeful donkeys, they're plotting right now. They're in caves <laughs> around the country. I don't, I don't plotting their revenge. I would love it. I would love it. Well, Amy comes in with four his face. <laughs> I'd love some donkeys if I had like land. I'd definitely have some. You can get those little miniature ones as well. They're super cute. Saw some yesterday. What, you mean like the one in Shrek? Yeah, little miniature They're donkey. like that then. Do they talk? No. What's the one in Shrek called? Donkey. donkey. It's donkey. called donkey, isn't donkey. it? It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> We've had animals. We had a goat once. I was driving around the countryside yesterday and I was just like, wow, just stunning. And just to have that land, and all over Shropshire I was, just to have some land and to have donkeys and your own chickens and stuff, that'd be the dream for me. Really? Yeah, I'd love that. Peaceful life. Do you notice any of that when you're off your nut? Anything yeah. well, like going out to the country? I didn't really try and get out that much to the country. But I remember finding a cat. I always used to bring animals back. But not like, it sounds like I've done it every five minutes, but like I've, <laughs> I've been known to bring animals back when I've been on a session. And I've been sent out to buy a substance and I've come back with a dog. And right. it was this, and, and I, I wish you'd have come to one of my Was parties. the dog alive? <laughs> A life, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not collecting roadkill like cereal? No. <laughs> you're not actually Jeffrey Dartmoor, are you? I bought two dogs, three cats. Where did you get them from? Did they not have owners? Just on the street. What? Just randomly. No, nah, he's a dog napper. But one morning, I got this dog and I took it in and I fed it pizza and I probably gave him a bed. <laughs> you gave a dog pizza? I was, oh, why not? At least you didn't give it chocolate. I don't know it's pizza and I know something else had done really nice for him as well I woke up in the morning <laughs> I looked I thought, what the fuck have I done 
I mean, what I was, kind of dogs were they? Any specific breed? Probably would have been a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Like or small something, ones. Something like that. I don't know. He had four legs and a nose. So that's all I remember. <laughs> but the owner was screaming up and down the street yesterday. And my husband was pie-eyed last night and he's happened to let the dog out. I'm not Let's give him back. Lou, his name was. Did you take yeah. him back and pretend that you found it? No. Or did you admit that you My housemate at the time was letting the dog out the front to have a wee of the fence. And this woman was screaming up and down the streets and seeing the dog. And was like, that's my dog. <laughs> what was really concerning was my friend said, the dog looked like it was scared of its own and wanted to run back into our house. Oh, my house. Maybe that's why it ran away. And I rescued a Jack Russell. Somebody was online and they were saying that they needed £40. And I was like, oh, it's pretty cool, man, little Jack Russell. So I went down to Coventry and picked him up and they was off their head. So obviously really? they wanted a, a rap or something. And he was lovely. Spike, he was Did named. you keep him? I tried. He ran. He just went away. Kept him for a few months. I changed his name to Peanut. Better than Spike. And I lost him. And I was running around the street. Peanut. In, in the way of them. Peanut. <laughs> Peanut. <laughs> so he never come back. Like, what were we on this conversation anyway? <laughs> I was asking if you actually noticed things like the countryside or any of that. Because obviously we always end up in one room, don't we? Yeah. In general. And we don't necessarily notice what's going on outside of us or going on around. But I'm intrigued by your cat napping and dog napping and claiming that this is some sort of public service. You know, <laughs> you know, calling rescuing. it rescuing is a bit of a stretch, Ronnie. <laughs> oh, there's a dog. I'll oh, take it. Oh, there's a cat. <laughs> More like Come, on. <laughs> Come on, Tiddles. <laughs> Listen, they're going out for people like me because I don't even... Oh, really we know. need someone like that on every street. On every street and every village and every town, we need someone that will take in dogs whenever they look confused or they need directions. So, apparently so, because my phone keeps going off and I don't even know how it works, but my doorbell is a ring doorbell and now it's telling me... Oh, so you get the video camera. Saying we've lost... Dog lost, brown, dog found, roaming streets. Hold on, sorry, a video camera doorbell does all of that? Yeah, I didn't know. No, that's the equivalent. Really? The Batman sign, when they put the thing up in the sky and it's got, we, we need Batman. Yeah. The reason why you're getting the dog notification is because they need you to go and kidnap the dog. Mm. So they're sending you messages. That's what's going on. I mean, that's what's going because on. They've Listen decided to the messages. This is the guy who picks up dogs and cats. <laughs> And then confuses them by changing their name. If you were psycho, you and keeping them. I know. I would have tripped balls at that message. <laughs> it's yeah, it's on the phone, and I'm like, I'm looking at it, and somebody put on there, "We've seen a brown dog roaming the streets. It's very young." And then this morning, someone said, no, "I've lost my dog. It's brown." I'm like, "Are you like, not reading these things? It must not just be me. Like, I think it's just, just uh, a neighbourhood thing." Like, like, I choose now that was to not turn a blind eye, but. I don't watch the news, the news too much anymore. And when I was in active addiction, I was always on the news and I read the Daily Mail front to back every single day, and including the Australian Did version you? and the American. I wonder what's worse for you six litres of white frightening a day or reading the Daily Mail. It's a toss up, really, which one's quite, worse for quite you. Quite frightening. Because while the chemicals would be physically damaging, I don't think there was mentally damaging as the Daily Mail is. It really mm. corrupted my head, honestly. It corrupted. I became so opinionated and really angry. I was on the chat things you put on the bottom. How dare oh, yeah, you yeah, yeah. rip down Nelson's column? Mm. Stuff like that. <laughs> like, where did this come from? It whips up this feigned outrage in you. And it's, it's, it's also the very thing that if you are cautious in your recovery that you are not likely to fall into. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that we try and acknowledge. When we're talking about the anger thing, talking about seeing it happening and not actually acting on it. Yeah. But that kind of inflammatory publication that's deliberately designed to whip you up into a frenzy, I don't think you're anywhere near as susceptible when you're in recovery. No. Well, you're not susceptible if you don't watch it. I don't watch it, I don't read it, I don't watch anything. Like and that. also, you're trying to avoid engaging with things that are deliberately meant to set you mm. off and a lot of the media a lot of twitter a lot of the papers are deliberately designed to create these great diametric oppositions mm. like you hate this or you love this and you're not allowed a considered opinion if you fall into reading it all day every day 
Whereas if you don't engage with it, you've got far more chance of formulating a reasonable opinion. I just remember being very angry and I was, my opinions was obnoxious. I mean, I was believing some of this stuff they were saying and then I built up these... But do you think it could still happen to someone in recovery? Yeah, it could do. It depends if they've got too much time on their hands and they think they've got literally nothing to do and they're reading the papers and, and they've probably still got anger or they haven't let go of resentments or they haven't done any work on themselves and stuff. Just because you're in recovery doesn't mean that you're recovering, does it? It doesn't mean you're in recovery, mm. no. Yeah. It's like you just existed and some people, I believe, they're here just to tick the box of, well, they need a roof. There is a community, isn't there, that you could be part of and that actually really want to better yourself or anything. That, Bonnie, is the critical thing about those first 18 months, isn't it? Because mm. if you think about the tick list that people have, I'm skinned. I don't know whether I've still got a roof over my head. I've got to do something because of what everybody else is telling me. And maybe if I do this for X number of months, it'll get them off my back. It'll get me somewhere to live. I'll go through the motions. Okay, they say three meetings a week. I'll go three times, but I'll hang about during the break for 35 minutes at every meeting. Or I'll leave early. Or I'll say I've been to meetings on my own when I haven't. Or I'll get an invisible sponsor. Mm. Or I'll keep arranging volunteer work or a training course that keeps falling through and getting rearranged mm. without actually ever really arranging it so that whoever I'm talking to doesn't know what I'm doing or not doing. They can do it for 18 months, can't they? Of course they can. They can do it for a lot longer than that. And what happens after that? You know what? It's crazy. Isn't Invariably, it? they relapse. They relapse, and is there more of a choice there as well? Is it, you know, oh, God, I'm, let's reset this clock again and let me get back through the system again because... It's that thing, isn't it? Fake it to make it sometimes as well. Because mm. some people who are in there and they're like, I know I wanted to get well. I didn't think I was going to improve myself. I just thought I just needed to stop drinking. The next option was to move on to a next stage and sort of drag me to a meeting. And before I knew it, this stuff was working when I was stuck at it. So even for some people that haven't got the idea that they want to do it, but they just do it anyway to tick the boxes, some of those will just naturally fall into shit this stuff works maybe this is a good idea for me to continue it well that's coming for the wrong reasons and staying for the right <coughs> reasons yeah. isn't mm -hmm. it whereas if we look at this model whereby people have got an agenda which is i'm going to go through the motions and tick every box and then i'm going to move on after 18 months or whatever if you do that four times then you're pretty much accounted for 10 years where well, you're not having to be responsible for yourself at all that's it yeah because it's not just looking at this one finite period where you go to rehab, it's the treatment hopping. They go and do it in one place, they go mm. and do it in another, then another, mm. and then come back to the first place. And before you know it, you spent 10 years of supposedly being in recovery. Your body is recovering because mm. you're having significant periods of time where you're not drinking or using, but you're not really engaged with the recovery process. And yeah, there are those people, Ronnie, that come in and they've clearly come in just because they've got no other choice. Mm. Their family's cut them off, they've got rent they can't pay, they've got all of this stuff hanging over them. And then suddenly they're starting to think, shit, this might work. Yeah. But they're in the minority, I think. Mm. And I don't want to say that the majority of people who come to rehab come for the wrong reasons. No. Because it's still a big thing to be deciding. They're trying. Yeah. It's very hard, isn't it? To, to even mean, get there. Get into rehab, walk through them doors and stay. Yeah. That was hard for me. That was really yeah, To do that and to stay for the first week, mm -hmm. as we do it at Changes, to be coming in and then just thrown in, into groups. That's what happened to Beer Rad. I was having panic attacks every morning. As soon as I woke up, I was having a real full-blown panic attack. And that was because my meds wasn't working because I was drinking. Mm. I was on all the meds for panic attacks and all that stuff. But mm. they, didn't keep, they didn't work. So without the booze. In the same way as people use rehab in different ways, do you think there's a total gamut across the board of different expectations of people when they go in? Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. I think because it's quite a simple program and it can be done in a very simplistic way, people can overcomplicate it and think, my God, is that all you're going to teach me today? And it's such a simple thing that they're trying to get across to them, they don't realise that little simple thing is, but could end up killing you. But you have to really want it, the same as if you didn't come through rehab and you were just working a 12 step program without rehab. You have to want to do it. Of course. And that expectation when people come in is that. Sometimes they're doing it for the family and not, not for themselves, for the wrong reasons. 
Or they've got this limited expectation, which is, okay, I'll just stop. I'm not really going to listen to what they're telling me. I'll just stop and I'll use this as a fresh start. Or they've got absurd expectations, mm. like, oh, well, I'm sure they'll get me a flat if I stay for six months. Or they'll do this for me or they'll do that for me. The expectation that it's going to be done for you as opposed to you're going to do it yourself. Well, I had the expectation I could still use drugs. When I came into AA, I was like, oh, well, I'm not drinking. So, great. I'm smoking weed, I'm doing coke. You could feel that, wouldn't you? Had an ecstasy. Well, I did, and I didn't realise. I didn't know, so I was going, hi, my name's Amy, you know, I'm an alcoholic after two months of being sober. I put my hand up and started sharing. At three months, I relapsed on alcohol because I was still using the whole time. Mm. I bought a little pipe, a little clear pipe, so I could smoke weed in the clubs and stuff, so that I could just get away with it. And I was like, why? Why would you do that? That's not normal thinking. Because I was like, yeah, because I can't drink, so I'll just have a little puff and no one will smell it. Like, that was my delusion, that no yeah, one would even yeah, be able yeah, to yeah. smell it in the club. Ah, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Ah, like, I'd get kicked out of the by the bouncers, probably at the first puff. I didn't know that. When I went into rehab, the first time, into the treatment centre, and they was telling me I was an alcoholic, I thought, but you've got that wrong, haven't you? Because I'm not an alcoholic, because I've stopped drinking. So I just thought an alcoholic was someone who was drinking in the midst of it. If I'd stopped, then I'm not an alcoholic. And I agreed with them. Just to shut them up. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. That's my the head. crux, though, yeah. Ronnie, isn't it? My head's telling me, no, you, they don't realise you've got this. Because we go in and sit in there, and they tell us it's incredibly simple, and that there's only this to it. And we thought, well, is that it? I'm just going to cross the T's and dot the I's then, and I'll just say yes sir, no sir, three bags full. But actually, there's that huge wall of denial and not realising what all of this means. Mm. And it is, it's about denial and it's about a lack of open-mindedness. And the thing I see so frequently when I go in there into the rehab setting is where the open-mindedness is missing, where the expectations are unrealistic, where the denial is just written all over their face, particularly in the sessions that I deliver because they're very open and it's drama therapy rather than an ordinary group. It's very evident when people are closed-minded doing something like that. I do accept that some people can't help that. And it's rare that people come in and are genuinely open-minded. And that's the nature of rehab. Yeah. Because they have to find that open-mindedness in the course of that, however many weeks it is. And I don't expect to see it at all, if I'm honest. When I go in there, I don't expect any of them to be fully open-minded and open to anything. Because why would they be, considering where they've been? Yeah. Yeah, you've been close minded all your life you're not just suddenly going to walk into rehab and go oh right I'm up for this I'm up for that yeah. you do um, get the odd one I think it's an amazing thing to be able to do that I didn't do rehab and I didn't do a dry house or anything and I just think oh well how would it have been for me if I'd have had those groups and a bit of therapy on the side do you know what I mean and a fun like community I think that would have been really nice but I think to do it through the 12 steps I found it hard because I didn't understand any of the language and I didn't understand the concept. And actually, when I did my first step four, I was such a victim that I literally did a whole step four on everybody else. And what oh, the they Hollywood did step four. I did all of it. The yeah. full blown. Oh, did. and I was so set upon. Yeah. And she yeah. did this to me. Didn't and he look did that at to me. Didn't look at any of my part at all. <laughs> didn't even understand that concept. I was like, what? Like, I'm the victim here. Like, yeah. What do you mean I'm not the victim? Yeah. How dare you? But I think that was quite nice because I went to two or three meetings a day in London when I first got sober and clean. If I hadn't have had that, that was my sense of like dry house groups, yeah, just yeah, constantly yeah. going to meetings because I felt community. Yeah, yeah. That is a massive thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Community, connection, yeah. contacts and stuff like that. All which is what you get in those groups and dry houses, which is amazing. It gives you that extra support. Double-edged. It's double-edged, yeah. It's very double-edged, because if you're doing it around the rooms, you've got to find it for yourself. Yeah. It's double-edged in a rehab scenario, because on the one hand, it can be very positive, but if it goes the wrong way, it can be exactly the opposite, because you get passengers, I'm sure we've all seen. Yeah. The passengers who come to meetings on the coattails of someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And who you never see coming on their own, because they've gone through rehab with a group of people, they've stayed yeah. with them, and they yeah, all just yeah, go yeah, together. Yeah. And that ties in, Ronnie, with what you were saying about ticking boxes. Yeah. Obviously. And of course, of that group of five, two of them will genuinely want to be there mm -hmm. and will carry on going. Mm. But there's another three that probably won't, given the option. See, I needed that. The rehab 
difficult for me was good and I think rehab is something that can help you into it the position you're in now you, you're good and you've done it you, you've managed to do yeah. it without going through the rehab center and I think the rehab center introduced me to all of that kind of stuff outside groups and meetings and stuff like that but I honestly became feral Did you? real feral in the last five years of my drinking and the people that I was mixing with I became those and those kind of people crackheads smackheads and all sorts and that was my way of living that was my survival technique when I come into treatment it was like oh you know mm -hmm. a bit like what's going on here la -di -da, <laughs> you know, I remember being pulled into the office <clears throat> to be told that I shouldn't be making the jokes that I'm making towards people because they're very sensitive and I'm like sensitive <laughs> sensitive I still do need to just shake it up a little bit and yeah. have a laugh yeah yeah, but they all get sensitive in rehab, don't they? <laughs> but, but it was wrong. No, I'm sensitive. Because <laughs> I would say something that was, it would, wouldn't be nice, but I was just used to being spoken to like that and also speaking to people like that yeah. when I was in the madness. Me too, I'm very direct. Even now, and abrupt, mm -hmm. I can be very direct and abrupt. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I have to watch what I'm saying. My sponsor always tells me that as well. <laughs> you can say what you mean, but not say it in a mean way. I know, Amen. but sometimes... <laughs> I say stuff to people. We were talking about this last night around the table, and I remember saying, I said something to this one girl, and she went, Oh, do you know? And it was her ex partner. Thing is, relapse. That's the thing is, for every lad you touch, relapse is love. <laughs> is that what you oh! said? Oh! And it was like. <laughs> Did you want to put your words back in your mouth as soon as you said it or not? No. <laughs> <laughs> probably the most truly meant it. And it was the truth. Girl. Sometimes the truth hurts. Well, I know deep down she was probably thinking, well, actually, you know what, he's right. She only counts on her fingers and think about all her exes and realise. She might thank you in months to come. Yeah. Or she might never speak to you again. <laughs> she didn't speak to me. I've said a few things before. That said, I think there was a time and a place for being brutally direct. Yeah. And there's a time and a place for being compassionate. Yeah. And it's something that perhaps we don't know how to do when we start off in recovery. Definitely not. We don't know when we're supposed to be compassionate. We don't know when we're supposed to be brutal and we can get the two mixed up and end up saying the one thing to the wrong person mm. you can end up being compassionate to the one who's full of shit and then being brutal to the one who's actually vulnerable and that's not through any yeah. intention and actually you can say the wrong thing while intending to say the right one if you see what I mean mm. even though you're going through this process thinking oh I think this is the right tone to take here and not know that you've got it completely off of the tip yeah. because we don't necessarily know how to read people when we come out of rehab or come out of detox or come out of that initial couple of months when we're trying to find our feet mm. I try to pause more before I speak these days so that I'm not being abrasive to others I think sponsorship and sponsoring other people has taught me those kind of things, the principles yeah. I'm completely different to what I used to be my gosh, amazing <laughs> Thing is, if we do react and we feel like we're reacting in the wrong way, it's going to hurt us at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it hurts us as well as them, possibly as well. Yeah, it's a nice learning curve. I told one lad, you've done that to me again, I'll floor him. <laughs> and this is like, I'm not a fighter, <laughs> I don't fight or anything. And he tapped me on the back like this, but it was quite hard. I just snapped, and this was very early in recovery. And he said, If you do that to me one more time, I will floor you. <laughs> He accused me of being aggressive, a violent partner. <laughs> and he was that how you was with your exes then? Like why they left you? He was a bit of a yeah. Is that why they left and you? That learning curve in thinking again about that first eighteen months and the way that people tick boxes and stuff. It's about the engagement, isn't it? Because if you remain engaged with that learning curve, then things change over time, mm. and they continue to change over time because it is continuous. But if you are never engaging with that curve in the first place and you're staying smack in the place that you are stubbornly deciding to put yourself, you're never going to move, are you? So actually you spent 18 months just not drinking and using in spite of the best efforts of everyone around you. And this is where rehabs can never fully get it right because with some people you're just not going to make that happen. It's nearly impossible. I think you're very lucky to get the program understand the program and yeah. practice the program and get the results on what the program promises yeah. you and stuff like that when they said to me in treatment that only 10 percent or something i thought when i was sitting in that chair for whatever reason i thought well, no 
they all all screwed then because that's going to be me so i truly believed it but then i didn't realize as i was going through everything has to work in the right way doesn't it not just the treatment center but the people that you meet the choices that you make you're defined by the company you keep yeah you're yeah. defined by the choices you make you know one wrong look from somebody in a meeting and you fall in love and then before you know you're running off into the yeah house and it's like down the yellow brick road into the sunset getting married in vegas or whatever yeah. it is or gretna green depending on your budget you have to listen. The next thing you know is you're on your ass again and they're dead. Yeah, that came up yesterday, that day. The best thing you can do is just listen, isn't it? And listen to the old timers. But the problem is, so my problem was that when I put the drink and the drugs down, my next thing was sex and relationships and I was constantly on the prowl in recovery. I was one of those creepy... It's not a good place to be. No, I was constantly creeping on people. Predator. When I was, I was quite predatory in a way, yeah. Not in the sense of, oh, like, you know, I want to, you know... It wasn't really, like, I wasn't acting on it, but I was a, a proper perv, constantly perving on all the boys and girls in recovery. And I think a lot of the times, some of the times that I went to those extra meetings were just to see those people, <laughs> which is healthy. That's elderly. another thing about box ticking, isn't it? Yeah. People treat it as a social occasion yeah, for well, whatever reason. For? And yeah. they go because they think so-and-so will be there. Yeah. Or might yeah. be there. Yeah. And they're not too. there at the meeting at all to be at the meeting. They're I, there to be outside it. Yeah, but I don't think I'm the only one. I think that no, no. every single human being that comes into recovery has this scenario. Because most people have addictions. And once you put those two down, there's the other one. And you're like, oh. And that's why so many people get into relationships. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've, I've been very lucky in, in the sense that I've been to a couple of meetings where I know certain people are going. But... I know the danger and I know it's wrong and if you know it's wrong you can do something about it can't yeah. you if you but you still have to make a choice yeah don't get me wrong I wasn't acting on it so for the first year I didn't act on it I was yeah, just I'm just perving. picturing you just praying on some innocence <laughs> I wasn't acting on it come into my parlour <laughs> into my lair like a spider <laughs> but when I got to that year exactly on the dot of the day I went come here Ash let's go <laughs> And there I was in a relationship for three months. <laughs> Straight on a year, my sponsor said to you, I was we like, had okay. Oh yesterday, and it was somebody who's coming up to their one year very soon, and somebody else that was in the group with us yesterday was said, well, oh, your one year is up there. <laughs> what are you going to do? Where are you going to see? You know, you're past the stage now, and I said, you can't really, you're just when you're comfortable, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know anything. But then some people get into relationships early on, they're fine. I just think if you don't have a healthy relationship like status like I do, like and you don't have healthy relationships with people, then it's complicated. But some people do when they get and into some relationships. Some people find it's a balance relatively quickly. Yeah. I Most people know. don't, but some people do. When I wake up in the morning, if I imagine that I've got somebody lying next to me in the morning, would I be happy that they're there or would I be pissed off that they're there? It's about how I'm going to wake up. This morning it would have been just don't even or would you need them to be in a, in a separate either. house like a separate house would be perfect yeah. yeah I've been so used to sleeping on my own I haven't had a relationship like proper one for like 8 years and I've been so used to sleeping on my own that to share a bed with somebody I just I think they'd just irritate me I think I'm better off like sharing separate houses yeah and also then you have to think of the other person schools, yeah. and it's like oh god are you effort. breathing? Are you breathing that loud again? <laughs> Stop eating so loud, you're snoring! It you didn't <laughs> Will you shut up? I'm trying to pray. <laughs> Coping with other people. <laughs> I'm in a straw to go with. Oh, God. I've got, I've got, um, the thing is, choices um, have consequences. Yeah. I've got a new obsession, which driving me Go on, what's the new obsession? Tell me about it. I love an obsession. Right. So, where we live, there's a communal uh-huh. car park. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Are you only allowed one car per, per household? No, because it's all shops. Okay. So it's just the way of people coming come and go from the shops to use the spaces. But obviously is there is a kennel as well for your stray dogs and cats? <laughs> there is no kennel. No. Donkey stop. Do you want to share a dog with me? We could do like duties. And you can bit, as long as you get it for 95%. <laughs> this is how I know. I'm looking for a dog dad. <laughs> yeah, so basically I'm just annoyed. I get so annoyed when somebody parks in one of the particular spaces that I park in. Uh, um, how many are there? Two. Spaces. The, yeah, the ones that you like. Two. Why do you like them so much? Because they're right close to me flat. 
Go ahead. And then like in amongst all the stuff, I could see my car come out the window, and I get this, and it, it's wrong, it's, it's wrong for me. Yeah, because they're not yours. They're not my spaces at all, but if I see somebody parked down right. Have you gone as far as sabotage? I, nearly. Yeah, the other day, the car was parked across. Apple in the exhaust? And I was, I was, <laughs> I was just going to put the window wipers right. in the car <laughs> with the guy parked across the two spaces. Oh, that's annoying. And I was just think in my head, okay, right, all of you lot down here are popping into that coffee shop, you mothers in your four by fours, right? Parking across two spaces, I'm judging. And when I'm driving back, like when I drive back now after here, I will have this anxiety come over me about whether this space yeah. is going to be there or not. And I know it's crazy. And it's no, wrong. it's not. I get it's it. It's not, Ron. It's it. where you live. So it's understandable. Yeah, but there's like, I could just park anywhere. There's about 20 spaces. But the spaces. thing is, we have habits as human beings. If you go to a meeting every week for 52 weeks of the year, chances are you will sit in the same seat for most of that year because we do that, that's what our muscle memory lets us do. And that's what we get used to doing. It's not oh. at all uncommon. If you live in a certain place, you have a certain place where you're used to seeing your car. Oh. It's a visual memory, a signifier. It's where you're used to, with muscle memory, driving into said space, stopping and the walk oh. up to your flat. It's actually, to have that disrupted is annoying. And also, because it's where you live, not mm. somewhere else, mm. it's more invasive. Especially if someone has been downright irresponsible and going across two spaces. But it is OCD, because I understand it, because I've got an issue with my brother and his girlfriend leaving their shoes in the house by the stairs. It drives me mad. And why can't you just leave them if you're going to leave them by the door? Chuck them in the bin. It drives me nuts. I wanted to. I wanted to throw them on the grass. I was going to throw them outside on the grass. Yeah. I'm obsessed with it. And I've had to really calm down because my, I had to speak to my mum about it because I am OCD. So I kept moving their shoes. <laughs> I was like, Get Ronnie to, to really give you some dog turds from one of the rescue dogs. <laughs> Put it in their Put shoes. Put it in the shoes. <laughs> well, I nearly went on Amazon because I wanted to buy You know when you get a parking <laughs> ticket, them yellow thing that you stick on the screen? I didn't get that to do oh, with, I was just going to buy yeah. them and put a nice little note in them saying oh, you know you've got the smallest car in the world and you took up the no, biggest you really thought about it. biggest <laughs> space in the world I'm assuming you've just dropped your children off to school and you're having coffee with your friends down the road <laughs> in the coffee shop down the road how come you you've got the what time do? to do this, you lazy fuck? <laughs> and that's what I'm thinking. How dare you have the time to block so, my parking space and, and quite, to have coffee with your friends? It's quite sexist as well, which I've, you know, I'll just admit it. I'll I'll just just say, admit I bet it's a bird it. that's parked that car. <laughs> what, what are you doing? It's terrible. You shouldn't be like that. I'm a really good driver, by the way. <laughs> just saying that. And that's wrong, isn't it? But it's a woman. <gasps> Ronnie. So the chances ways. are, if you come across, <laughs> see, I've got to really care for now. But yes. was it the first time this happened? Did you go into the coffee shop and check who was in there? Was it actually a woman? <laughs> but if it wasn't that the first time, you're just making blanket sexist assumptions. Yes, Bonnie. <laughs> was it? Be honest. Own it. I don't know. It doesn't know. Actually, when the perpetrators of these disgusting have turned up, <laughs> they have been women. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so this lady was parked up. She had a fiesta, and she she's the messy person in the world because I looked inside the car <laughs> full of rubbish. And I thought, this is going to be a man, and then it was a woman. Because I had to park on this sort of dodgy bit of corner where I've already hit the car into the fence because it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I feel like you need to do a resentment step then on this one. <laughs> so I looked at the woman, I went, <coughs> Are you moving? And she went, Yes, yes, I mean, oh, that's all right then, because it just means I get to move my car because I don't want to get a ticket there, so I made it nice afterward. After all, are you moving? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the person's gender is relevant to your complaint, Molly, but it's interesting how we compile them, because if I'm getting exasperated about something minor, I suddenly start painting a picture of this imaginary oh, person yeah. that I hate. <laughs> <laughs> that could be based on all sorts of stuff from my unconscious. Because there might be something yeah. that happened 20 years ago where someone did something similar and it happened to be a middle-aged man or it happened to be a young woman and I will project that onto it. Because when I get really, really angry like that about something that's not that consequential, 
I will invariably end up injecting something without even realising it from something that's happened before. It's actually the cars are parking across the double lines, the very small cars. Again, that's probably why I'm thinking maybe it's a lady because we all drive smaller cars. That's so sexist! Ronnie, Ronnie fuck you're off. on <laughs> shaky ground. I drive here. a bigger. I drive a big cutter out there. I've seen it. I was going to say. My car's Can I just like clarify Roger? that Ronnie's views are his own? I and do know. not represent uh, anyone else's Ronnie. or any organisation with which we're associated. Walk slap a horse, talk slap a horse, and quack slap a horse. It's a horse. <laughs> well, listen, we can't tarp all people with the same brush. Cause been... What if it was a donkey that was driving? <laughs> oh, no. Then I'd think I'd be taking some magic mushrooms and they're really strong. <laughs> yeah, but if it was one of your dwarf donkeys, <laughs> they could have an adapted seat or something, couldn't they? <laughs> No, what are them wolf dogs called? What are they called? Oh, uh, Border Collie. Sheep dogs. Wolves. Wolves. Huskies. Husky. Pomeranian husky. Oh, right. A Pomeranian husky. You've got You're a really small going dog. To the a miniature Pomeranian South husky. South Pole. They're that big and they look like wolves. Do they? Yeah. Oh no, they're too much interbreeding. Ah. Do you want a normal mongrel or do me? Like a big dog. That's more like Ron, a you're cat. not going to put it in a man bag, it's are you? more like you? a cat than a dog. He'll give it a coat, and he'll give it a monocle, and I it'll have it a just pipe. Looks cool. If you go on a dog hunt, can you please kind of put an order in for a cold It's not it? a toy. It's an animal. It's a living, breathing <laughs> thing. It's not That's a why toy. I got me on because, you know, dogs aren't just for Christmas. What do you think? Oh, about? it's for life. Border Collie or a Spring Spaniel for me, please. You're going to end really up like do. Paris Hilton carrying the dog in your uh, no, Not for that reason. I just think it looks cool. So basically, I'd give him like an action figure and he'd look like a, a he man with his bulk. In other words, you get him a load of costume. <laughs> you get a Darth Vader costume. <laughs> it's cute. An Indiana Jones Tea costume. Teacup Pomeranian Husky. Put it in the bag. Teacup. My friend's got a little Pomeranian. It's cute, but it has really bad breath. Thinking. So you're actually going to get your own dog, not take someone else's? I, I wouldn't get one, no. Again, I was pissed when I was looking at these teacup Pomeranian huskies. Mm. So not really thinking about the consequences? No, I just like the look of it. Maybe you need one to get his one for that. I like the style of it. The style, the style of it? Of what, it. its own personal style? Yeah, or it the style cool. overall? It cool, man. And it would eat anything they got in its way. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny. <laughs> Getting a dog, I think, or getting a cat is a pretty big deal. It's like in, having a child. Recovery. It's got to come before certain other things, hasn't it? I mean, getting a plant is one thing, but actually getting an animal is another altogether. Yeah. In terms of responsibility. I I'd love one this year. As soon as I've moved out of this place, I'm getting a dog. Full stop. See, I can't, I'd love to have a dog, but my OCD is to the point where I can't have it. Because sometimes but, I have my friend's dog for three days, and it's a lovely little dog. But then you just get a cleaner. It's also about the routine, though, isn't it? You have to change. I've got a dog your whole, blanket. I've got yeah. a dog pillow. I've got everything that's relate for the dogs because I don't want it touching anything <laughs> that isn't for the dog. The smell of the dog, not that. Yeah, the dog. but if you get a short-haired dog, they don't molt as much as specific dogs that you can get. Some Jean Paul Gaultier on it. Yeah, and they're cute. They bring so much love to your life. As soon as you've got one, you'd be like, oh, I don't care about the flowers. And you just like, just clean them up. They used to have rats. What? They just invaded? <laughs> you actually had them as no, pets? Cool. From the shop. Did you? Yeah, called them peanut and butter. They weren't free range rats. They were there was free controlled range, rats. There was free range. And the kitten that I found, which we called Lucky, I got them, all three of them, and they'd play together. Oh, cute. Mm. I just. Oh, you got them to do a sit down and agree to play. I'd sit there drunk at night and I'd have a peanut on one shoulder, butter on the other shoulder, and that'd be cat. Oh, that's cute. And the cat wouldn't go for them. Yeah. Although that surprises me. Cats would normally kill the rats. I suppose it's a bit like your domestic appliances, isn't it? If you mm. get them to talk to each other, they're prepared to coexist. <laughs> if you didn't have that dialogue between, say, your fridge and your cooker, then you'd, they'd start swapping roles just to annoy you or refuse to work together. And if you've got a cat and a dog, <coughs> you obviously have to have dialogues. How weird. I don't know what they say to each other, but they must say something. This... Well, what's your doorbell done now? No, we're just talking about my cat and my two rats. And the pictures come and up? And the pictures on there of my cat and the two rats. They're actually in the cage there, so you can't see oh, them. Oh, yeah. But basically, that was a picture of my little cat called Lucky. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to stop. <laughs> Just turn it off. <laughs> turn it off. I rescued him. Cute. <laughs>
They're... Hold on, but what happened to Lucky as well? Look. What happened to Lucky? There's a two. And what happened to the rats? Probably wasn't <laughs> very lucky. There's the rats and there's the cats. Oh my god, that's them. hilarious. But what happened to them? Well, I'll give the rats to the barbers. Because when I come into recovery, I couldn't bring my cat, could I? So I got into a treatment centre when I was homeless. So I had to give my cat to my friend that I used to live with in the wet house that I lived in. Yeah. I said, like, you have to have the cat. I had a cat, and then I thought, oh, no, it's lonely. So then I went to go get another cat, but then I couldn't split the other two cats up because they're the brothers and sisters. Yeah, so then it ended up with three cats. And then I had to give them all away because I wasn't capable of looking after them because I was such a wreck at that I wouldn't come home and it just wasn't fair on the cats. So then I had mm. to give them away. Yeah, I felt really guilty about that for years. I was just saying that with my Yorkshire terror. I used to be sleeping all day and he used to be going, oh, well, in that bit of ground. Yeah. You know, shut up. Yeah. I knew someone once who had four cats and they didn't have individual names. Did they? They were know? just called the Smiths. The Smiths? <laughs> four cats and they were just called the Smiths. The Smiths. I remember going around to her place and trying to call one of them Morrissey and trying to call one of them Johnny Marr. And she said, no, 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 they're all the Smiths. The Smiths. They're all just the Smiths. I said, well, do you, how do you get them into They don't come individually. They come as a unit. <laughs> That's hilarious. A unit. <laughs> so they have a collection of identity. I was half expecting them to get out little guitars and stuff. <laughs> but of course, if we're going to be responsible for animals, we have to be responsible for ourselves. Yeah, and I wasn't in that place with those three cats at all. Do you think there was an element of your rats and cat looking after you, Ronnie? Oh, yeah. I wonder yeah. what they said about you behind your back when you were in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> You'd left the cage with a silly brat. That bitch hasn't come home again. She's out for another three days. Yeah, I know, Keeps overfeeding us. How was always overfeeding? I don't want to eat pizza anymore. It's funny, isn't it, how whatever we talk about, there's always something that makes the dreaded R word. Really responsibility tense. it always comes up and it's unavoidable if you're going to engage with the whole recovery process these days i'm kind of glad of that but there was a time when i wasn't there was a time when it was the last thing i wanted and that ties back in with what you said earlier ronnie about the ticking boxes mm. i'm just going to tick boxes i'm going to go through the motions because i'm not actually going to be responsible here and if i'm not going to be responsible i might as well just tread water for 18 months and then it's just a question of when I get pissed in it. Yeah. And on that wonderful, enlightening and happy thought, we've done it again. If you've heard anything that's resonated with you, whether it be with you, whether it be with someone you love, someone you know, someone you don't know, someone you might know, someone you think you know, someone that thinks they know you, or their tennis partner, or their bowls collaborator, or their curling coordinator, or their neighbour's cat, then do seek help. Yeah. Amen. By that, I mean absolutely anyone. Because we can be affected by someone else's alcoholism or drug intake, even if we don't live with them. And so can our pets. And even if we don't know them very well. And yes, so can our pets. Mm -hmm. And pets can actually be traumatised by this stuff. Ronnie's cat and rat, we don't know whether they ever got over it. We hope they did. But on a serious note, there is plenty of help out there. And it's not all stuff that you have to pay for. Google it and try it, because it's only by trying it and engaging it. So we'll love you with you and we'll be back next week. Good night from me. Good night, Vienna. Good night, Vienna. <laughs>